said Mary. "'We can't begin life at Crickhollow with a quarrel over baths.' "'In that room there are three tubs and a copper full of boiling water. "'There are also towels, mats, and soap. "'Get inside and be quick.' "'All right!' "'Mary and Fatty went into the kitchen on the other side of the passage "'and busied themselves with the final preparations for late supper. "'Snatches of competing songs came from the bathroom "'mixed with the sound of splashing and wallowing. "'The voice of Pippin was suddenly lifted up above the others "'in one of Bilbo's favorite bath songs.' Sing hey for the bath and clothes of day that washes the weary mud away. Hey noon is he that will not sing. Oh, water hot is a noble thing. Oh, sweet is the sound of falling rain and the brook that leaps from hill to plain. But better than rain or rippling streams is water hot that smokes and steams. Oh, water cold we may pour at me Down a thirsty throat and glad indeed But better is beer it drink we lack And water hot pour down the back A oh, water fair that leaps on high With a fountain wide beneath the sky But never did fountain sound so sweet As splashing hot water with my feet There was a terrific splash And a shout of Frodo it appeared that a lot of Pippin's baths had imitated a fountain and leaped on high. Mary went to the door. What about supper and beer in the throat? he called. Frodo oh. came out drying his hair. There's so much water in the air that I'm coming into the kitchen to finish, he said. Locks, said Mary, looking in. The stone floor was swimming. You ought to mop all that up before you get anything to eat, Peregrine, he said. Hurry up or we shan't wait for you. They had supper in the kitchen on the table near the fire. I suppose you three don't want mushrooms again, said Fredegar without much hope. Yes, we shall, cried Pippin. They're mine, said Frodo, given to me by Mrs. Maggot, a queen among farmers' wives. Take your greedy hands away, and I'll serve them. Hobbits have a passion for mushrooms, surpassing even the greediest likings of big people, a fact which partly explains young Frodo's long expeditions to the renowned fields of the Marish and the wrath of the injured Maggot. On this occasion there was plenty for all, even according to Hobbit standards. There were also many other things to follow, and when they had finished, even Fatty Bolger heaved a sigh of content. They pushed back the table and drew chairs around the fire. We'll clear up later, said Mary. Now tell me, what about it? I guess that you've been having adventures which was not quite fair without me. I want a full account. And most of all, I want to know what was the matter with old Maggot, and why he spoke to me like that. He sounded him almost as if he was scared, if that was possible. We have all been scared, said Pippin after a pause, in which Frodo stared at the fire and did not speak. You would have been too, if you had been chased for two days by black riders. And what are they? Black figures riding on black horses, answered Pippin. If Frodo won't talk... I will tell you the whole tale from the beginning. He then gave a full account of their journey from the time that they left Hobbiton. Sam gave various supporting nods and exclamations. Frodo remained silent. <laughs> I should think you were making it all up, said Mary, if I had not seen the black shape on the landing stage and heard the queer sound in Maggot's voice. What do you make of it all, Frodo? Cousin Frodo has been very close, said Pippin, but the time has come for him to open out. So far we have been given nothing more to go on than Farmer Maggot's guess that it has something to do with old Bilbo's treasure. That was only a guess, said Frodo hastily. Maggot does not know anything. Old Maggot is a shrewd fellow, said Mary. A lot goes on behind his round face that does not come out in his talk. I've heard that he used to go to the old forest at one time, and he has a reputation of knowing a good many strange things. But you can at least tell us, Frodo, whether you think his guess is good or bad. I think answered Frodo slowly, that it was a good guess, as far as it goes. There is a connection with Bilbo's old adventures, and the riders are looking, or perhaps one ought to say searching for him, or for me. I also fear, if you want to know, that it is no joke at all, and that I am not safe here or anywhere else. He looked around at the windows and walls, as if he was afraid they would suddenly give way. The others looked at him in silence and exchanged meaning glances amongst themselves. It's coming out in a minute, whispered Pippin to Mary. Mary nodded. Well, 
said Frodo at last, sitting up and straightening his back, as if he had made a decision. I can't keep it dark any longer. I have got something to tell you all, but I don't know quite how to begin. I think I could help you, said Mary quietly, by telling you some of it myself. What do you mean? said Frodo, looking at him anxiously. Just this, my dear Frodo. You're miserable because you don't know how to say goodbye. You've meant to leave the Shire, of course, but danger has come on you sooner than you'd expected. And now you're making up your mind to go at once. And you don't want to. We are very sorry for you. Frodo opened his mouth and shut it again. His look of surprise was so comical that they laughed. <laughs> Dear old Frodo, said Pippin, did you really think you had thrown dust in all our eyes? You've not been nearly careful or clever enough for that. You've obviously been planning to go and saying farewell to all your haunts all this year since April. We've constantly heard you muttering, shall I ever go down into that valley again, I wonder, and things like that. And pretending that you had come to the end of your money and basically selling your beloved bag end to those Sackville Bagginses and all those close talks with Gandalf. Good heavens, said Frodo. I thought I'd been both careful and clever. I, I don't know what Gandalf would say. Is all the Shire discussing my departure then? Oh, no, said Merry. Don't worry about that. The secret won't keep for long, of course. But at present, it is, I think, only known to us conspirators. After all, you must remember that we know you well and are often with you. We can usually guess what you're thinking. I knew Bilbo, too. To tell you the truth, I'd been watching you rather closely ever since he left. I thought you would go after him sooner or later. Indeed, I expected you to go sooner, and lately we've been very anxious. We've been terrified that you might give us the slip and go off suddenly, all on your own, like he did. Ever since this spring, we've kept our eyes open and done a good deal of planning on our own account. You're not going to escape so easily. But I must go, said Frodo. It cannot be helped, dear friends. It is wretched for us all. But it is no use your trying to keep me. Since you've guessed so much, please help me and do not hinder me. You do not understand, said Pippin. You must go, and therefore we must too. Mary and I are going with you. Sam is an excellent fellow and would jump down a dragon's throat to save you, if he did not trip over his own feet. But you will need more than one companion on your dangerous adventure. <sighs> My dear and most beloved hobbits, said Frodo, deeply moved. But I, I could not allow it. I decided that long ago, too. You speak of danger, but you do not understand. This is not treasure hunt, no there and back journey. I'm flying from deadly peril into deadly peril. Of course we understand, said Mary firmly. That is why we have decided to come. We know the ring is no laughing matter, but we are going to do our best to help you against the enemy. The ring, said Frodo, now completely amazed. Yes, the ring. My dear old hobbit, don't you allow for inquisitiveness of friends. I've known about the existence of the ring for years. Before Bilbo went away, in fact. But since he obviously regarded it as secret, I kept the knowledge in my head until we formed our conspiracy. I did not know Bilbo, of course, as well as I know you. I was too young. If you want to know how I first found out, I'll tell you. Go on, said Frodo faintly. It was the Sackville Bagginses that were his downfall, as you might expect. One day, a year before the party, I happened to be walking along the road when I saw Bilbo ahead. Suddenly, in the distance, the SBs appeared, coming towards us. Bilbo slowed down, and hey, presto, he vanished. I was so startled, I hardly had the wits to hide myself in a more ordinary fashion, but I got through the edge and walked along the field inside. I was peeping through the road after the SBs had passed, and was looking straight at Bilbo when he suddenly reappeared. I caught a glint of gold as he put something back into his trouser pocket. After that, I kept my eyes open. In fact, I confess that I spied. You must admit that it was very intriguing. And I was only my teens. I must be the only one in the Shire besides you, Frodo, that has ever seen the old fellow's secret book. You read his book? cried Frodo. Good heavens above, is nothing safe? Hmm, not too safe, I should say, said Mary. But I have only had one rapid glance, and that was difficult to get. He never left the book about. I wonder what became of it. I should like another look. Have you got it, Frodo? No, it was not a bag end. He must have taken it away. Hmm. Well, as I was saying, Mary proceeded, 
I kept my knowledge to myself, till the spring when things got serious. Then we formed our conspiracy, and as we were serious too, and meant business, we have not been too scrupulous. You're not a very easy nut to crack, and Gandalf is worse. But if you want to be introduced to our chief investigator, I can introduce him. W where is he? said Frodo, looking around as if he expected a masked and sinister figure to come out of a cupboard. Step forward, Sam, said Merry. And Sam stood up with the face scarlet up to the ears. Here's our collector of information, and he collected a lot, I can tell you, before he was finally caught, after which I may say, he seemed to regard himself as on parole and dried up. <laughs> Sam! cried Frodo, feeling that amazement could go no further and quite unable to decide whether he felt angry, amused, relieved, or merely foolish. Yes, sir, said Sam. Begging your pardon, sir, but I, I meant no wrong to you. Mr. Frodo, nor, nor, nor Mr. Gandalf, for that matter. He has some sense, mind you, and when you, when you said go alone, he said no, take someone you can trust. But it does not seem that I can trust anyone, said Frodo. Sam looked at him unhappily. It all depends on what you want, put in Mary. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin, to the bitter end. And you can trust us to keep any secret of yours, closer than you keep it yourself. But you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone and go off without a word. Or your friends, Frodo. Anyway, there it is. We know most of what Gandalf has told you. We know a good deal about the ring. We are horribly afraid. But we are coming with you, or following you like hounds. And after all, sir, added Sam, you did ought to take the elves' advice. Gildor said you should keep them as willing, and you can't deny it. I don't deny it, said Frodo, looking at Sam, who was now grinning. I don't deny it, but I'll never believe you are sleeping again. Whether you snore or not, I shall kick you hard to make sure... You are a set of deceitful scoundrels, he said, turning to the others. <laughs> but bless you, he laughed, <laughs> getting up and waving his arms. I give in. I will take Gildor's advice. If the danger were not so dark, I should dance for joy. Even so, I cannot help feeling happy, happier than I have felt for a long time. I had dreaded this evening. Good. That's settled. Three cheers for Captain Frodo and company! They shouted, and they danced around him. Merry and Pippin began a song, which they had apparently got ready for the occasion. It was made on the model of the dwarf song that started Bilbo on his adventure long ago, and went to the same tune. Farewell we call to hearth and hall, The wind may blow and rain may fall, We must away ere break of day, Far over wood and mountain tall, to Rivendell where elves yet dwell, in glades beneath the misty fell. Through moor and waste we ride in haste, and whither then we cannot tell. With foes ahead behind us tread. Beneath the sky shall be our bed Until at last our toil be past Our journey done, our errand sped We must away, we must away We ride before the break of day Very good, said Frodo. But in that case, there are a lot of things to do before we go to bed, under a roof, or tonight, or at any rate. Oh, that was poetry, said Pippin. Do you really mean to start before the break of day? I don't know. I fear those black riders, and I'm sure it is unsafe to stay in one place long, especially in a place to which it is known I was going. Also, Gildor advised me not to wait, but I should very much like to see Gandalf. I could see that even Gildor was disturbed when he heard that Gandalf had never appeared. It really depends on two things. How soon could the riders get to Bucklebury? And how soon should we get off? It will take a good deal of preparation. The answer to your second question, said Mary, is that we could get off in an hour. I've prepared practically everything. 
There are six ponies in the stable across the fields. Doors and tackle are all packed. Except for a few extra clothes and the perishable food. It seems to have been a very efficient conspiracy, said Frodo. But what about the Black Riders? Would it be safe to wait one day for Gandalf? Oh, that all depends on what you think the Riders would do if they found you here, answered Merry. They could have reached here by now, of course, if they were not stopped at the north gate, where the hedge runs out to the river bank, just this side of the bridge. The gate guards would not let them through by night. Though they might break through, even in the daylight they would try to keep them out, I think. At any rate, until they got the message through to the master of the hole, for they would not like the look of the riders, and would certainly be frightened of them. But of course, Buckland cannot resist a determined attack for long. And it is possible that in the morning even a black rider that rode up and asked for Mr. Baggins would be let through. It is pretty generally known that you are coming back to live at Crick Hollow. Frodo sat for a while in thought. I have made up my mind, he said finally. I am starting tomorrow, as soon as it is light. But I am not going by road. It would be safer to wait here than that. If I go through the north gate, my departure from Buckland will be known at once, instead of being secret for several days at least, as it might be. And what is more... The bridge and the east road near the borders will certainly be watched, whether any rider gets into Buckland or not. We don't know how many there are, but there are at least two, and possibly more. The only thing to do is to go off in a quite unexpected direction. But, but that can be a, but, but that can only mean going into the old forest, said Fredegar, horrified. You can't be thinking of doing that. It is quite as dangerous as black riders. Not quite, said Mary. It sounds very desperate, but I believe Frodo is right. It is the only way of getting off without being allowed at once. With luck, we might get a considerable start. Uh, but, but, but you won't have any luck in the old forest, objected Fredegar. No one ever has luck in there. You'll get lost. People don't go in there. Oh, yes, they do, said Mary. The brandy bucks go in occasionally when the fit takes them. We have a private entrance. Frodo went in once, long ago. I've been in several times, usually in daylight, of course, when the trees are sleepy and fairly quiet. Well, do as you think best, said Fredegar. I am more afraid of the old forest than of anything I know about. The stories about it are a nightmare. My vote hardly counts as I'm not going on the journey. Still, I'm very glad someone is stopping behind to tell Gandalf what you've done when he turns up as I am sure he will before long. Fond as he was of Frodo, Fratty Bolger had no desire of leaving the Shire, nor to see what lay outside it. His family came from East Farthing, from Budgeford and Bridgefields, in fact, but he had never been over the Brandywine Bridge. His task, according to the original plans of the conspirators, was to stay behind and deal with inquisitive folk, and to keep up as long as possible the pretense that Mr. Baggins was still living at Crick Hollow. He had even brought along some old clothes of Frodo's to help him in playing the part. They little thought how dangerous that part might prove. Excellent, said Frodo, when he understood the plan. We could not have left any message behind for Gandalf otherwise. I don't know whether these riders can read or not, of course, but I should not have dared to risk a written message in case they got in and searched the house. But if Fatty is willing to hold on the fort, and I can be sure of Gandalf knowing the way we have gone, that decides me. I'm going into the old forest, first thing tomorrow. Well, that's that, said Pippin. On the whole, I'd rather have our job than Fatty's, waiting here till Black Riders come. You wait well till you are well inside the forest, said Fredegar. You'll wish you were back here with me before this time tomorrow. It's no good arguing about it any more, said Mary. We have still got to tidy up and put the finishing touches to the packing. Before we get to bed, I shall call you all before the break of day. When at last he had gone to bed, Frodo could not sleep for some time. His legs ached. He was glad that he was riding in the morning. Eventually, he fell into a vague dream, in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below, among the roots, there was the sound of creatures crawling and sniffing. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest. Then he knew that it was not leaves, but the sound of the sea, far off. A sound he had never heard in waking life, though it had often troubled his dreams. 
Suddenly, he found he was out in the open. There were no trees after all. He was on a dark hearth, and there was a strange salt smell in the air. Looking up, he saw before him a tall white tower, standing alone on a high ridge. A great desire came over him to climb towards the tower, but suddenly a light came in the sky, and there was a noise of thunder. Frodo woke suddenly. It was still dark in the room. Mary was standing there with a the candle in one hand and banging on the door with the other. All right, what is it? said Frodo, still shaken and bewildered. What is it? cried Mary. It's time to get up. It's half past four and very foggy. Come on, Sammy's already getting breakfast ready. Even Pippin is up. I'm just going to saddle the ponies and fetch the one that is to be the baggage carrier. Wake that sluggard fatty, at least he must get up and see us off. Soon after six o'clock, the five hobbits were ready to start. Fatty Bolger was still yawning. They stole quietly out of the house. Mary went in front, leading a laden pony, and took his way along a path that went through a spinney behind the house and then cut across several fields. The leaves of trees were glistening, and every twig was dripping. The grass was grey with cold dew. Everything was still, and faraway noises seemed near and clear, fowls chattering in a yard, someone closing a door of a distant house. In their shed they found the ponies, sturdy little beasts of the kind loved by hobbits, not speedy, but good for a long day's work. They mounted, and soon they were riding off into the mist, which seemed to open reluctantly before them and close forbiddingly behind them. After riding for about an hour, slowly and without talking, they saw the hedge looming suddenly ahead. It was tall and netted over with silver cobwebs. How are you going to get through this? asked Fredegar. Follow me, said Mary, and you will see. He turned to the left along the hedge, and soon they came to a point where it bent inwards, running along the lip of a hollow. A cutting had been made at some distance from the hedge, and went slopingly gently down into the ground. It had walls of bricks at the sides which rose steadily, until suddenly they arced over and formed a tunnel that dived deep under the hedge and came out in the hollow on the other side. Here Fatty Bolger halted. Goodbye, Frodo, he said. I wish you were not going into the forest. I only hope you will not need rescuing before the day is out. But good luck to you, today and every day. If there are no worse things ahead than the old forest, I shall be lucky, said Frodo. Tell Gandalf to hurry along the east road. We shall soon be back on it and going as fast as we can. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye they cried, and rode down the slope and disappeared from Fredegar's sight into the tunnel. It was dark and damp. At the far end it was closed by a gate of thick set iron bars. Mary got down and unlocked the gate, and when they all had passed through, he pushed it to again. It shut with a clang, and the lock clicked. The sound was ominous. There, said Mary. You have left the Shire and are now outside and on the edge of the old forest. Are the stories about it true? asked Pippin. I don't know what stories you mean, Mary answered. If you mean the old bogey stories Fatty's nurses used to tell him about goblins and wolves and things of that sort, I should say no. At any rate, I don't believe him. But the forest is queer. Everything in it is very much more alive and more aware of what's going on, so to speak, than things that are in the Shire. And the trees do not like strangers. They watch you. They are usually content merely to watch you as long as daylight lasts, and don't do much. Occasionally the most unfriendly ones that may drop a branch, or stick a root out, or grasp you with a long trailer. But at night things can be most alarming, or so I'm told. I've only once or twice been here after dark, and then only near the hedge. I thought all the trees were whispering to each other, passing news and plots along the unintelligible language, and the branches swayed and groped without any wind. They do say the trees do actually move, and can surround strangers and hem them in. In fact, not long ago they attacked the hedge. They came and planted themselves right by it and leaned over it. 
But the hobbits came and cut down hundreds of trees and made a great bonfire in the forest and burned all the ground in a long strip east of the hedge. After that, the trees gave up the attack, but they became very unfriendly. There is still a wide bare space not far inside where a bonfire was made. Is it only the trees that are dangerous? asked Pippin. There are various queer things living deep in the forest and on the far side, said Mary, or at least I've heard so but I've never seen any of them. But something makes paths. Whenever one comes inside, one finds open tracks, but they seem to shift and change from time to time in a queer fashion. Not far from this tunnel there is, or was for a long time, the beginnings of a quite broad path leading to the bonfire glade, and then on more or less in our direction, east and a little north. That is the path I'm trying to find. The hobbits now left the tunnel gates and rode across the wide hollow. On the far side there was a faint path leading up to the floor of the forest, a hundred yards and more beyond the hedge, but it vanished as soon as it brought them under the trees. Looking back, they could see the dark line of hedge through the stems of trees that were already thick about them. Looking ahead, they could see only tree trunks of innumerable sizes and shapes, straight or bent, twisted, leaning squat or slender, smooth or gnarled and branched and all the stems were green or grey with moss and slimy shaggy growths. Mary alone seemed fairly cheerful. You had better lead on and find that path, Frodo said to him. Don't let us lose one another. I forget which way the hedge lies. They picked away among the trees, and their ponies plodded along, carefully avoiding the many writhing and interlacing roots. There was no undergrowth. The ground was rising steadily, and as they went forward it seemed that the trees became taller, darker, and thicker. There was no sound, except an occasional drip of moisture falling through the still leaves. For the moment there was no whispering or movement among the branches, but they all got an uncomfortable feeling that they were being watched with disapproval, deepening to dislike and even enmity. The feeling steadily grew until they found themselves looking up quickly or glancing back over their shoulders as if they expected a sudden blow. There was not as yet any sign of a path, and the trees seemed constantly to bar their way. Pippin suddenly felt that he could not bear it any longer and without warning let out a shout. Oi! Oi! I'm not going to do anything! Just let me pass through, will you? The others halted, startled, but the cry fell as if muffled by a heavy curtain. There was no echo or answer, though the woods seemed to become more crowded and more watchful than before. I should not shout if I were you, said Mary. It does more harm than good. Frodo began to wonder if it were possible to find a way through, and if he had been right to make the others come into this abominable wood. Mary was looking from side to side, and seemed already uncertain which way to go. Pippin noticed it. It has not taken you long to lose us, he said. But at that moment, Mary gave a whistle of relief and pointed ahead. Well, well, he said. These trees do shift. There is a bonfire glade in front of us, or I hope so, but the path to it seems to have moved away. The light grew clearer as they went forward. Suddenly, they came out of the trees and found themselves in a wide, circular space. There was sky above them, blue and clear to their surprise, for down under the forest roof they had not been able to see the rising morning and the lifting of the mist. The sun was not, however, high enough yet to shine down into the clearing, though its light was on treetops. The leaves were all thicker and greener about the edges of the glade, enclosing it with an almost solid wall. No tree grew there, only rough grass and many tall plants, stalky and faded hemlocks and wood parsley, fireweed sending into fluffy ashes, and rampant nettles and thistles. A dreary place, but it seemed a charming and cheerful garden after the close forest. The hobbits felt encouraged, and looked up hopefully at the broadening daylight in the sky. At the far side of the glade there was a break in the wall of trees, and a clear path beyond it. They could see it running on into the wood, wide in places and open above, though every now and again the trees drew in and overshadowed it with their dark boughs. Up this path they rode. Up this path they rode. They were still climbing gently, but they now went much quicker and with better heart, for it seemed to them that the forest had re relented 
and was going to let them pass unhindered after all. But after a while the air began to get hot and stuffy. The trees drew close again on either side, and they could no longer see far ahead. Now stronger than ever they felt again the ill will of the wood pressing on them. So silent was it that the fall of their ponies' hoofs, rustling on dead leaves, and occasionally stumbling on hidden roots, seemed to thud in their ears. Frodo tried to sing a song to encourage them, but his voice sank to a murmur. The wanderers in the shadowed land, despair not for though dark they stand, all woods there be must end at last, and see the open sun go past, the setting sun, the rising sun, the day's end or the day begun, for at for east or west all woods must fail. Fail. Even as he said the word, his voice faded into silence. The air seemed heavy, and the making of wood wearisome. Just behind them a large branch fell from an old overhanging tree with a crash into the path. The tree seemed to close in before them. They do not like all that about yending and failing, said Mary. I should not sing any more at present. Wait till we get to the edge, and then we'll turn and give them a rousing chorus. He spoke cheerfully, and if he felt any great anxiety, he did not show it. The others did not answer. They were depressed. A heavy weight was settling steadily on Frodo's heart, and he regretted now with every step forward that he had ever thought of challenging the menace of the trees. He was, indeed, just about to stop and propose going back, if that was still possible when things took a new turn. The path stopped climbing, and became for a while nearly level. The dark trees drew aside, and ahead they could see the path going almost straight forward. Before them, but some distance off, there stood a green hilltop, treeless, rising like a bald head out of the encircling wood. The path seemed to be making directly for it. They now hurried forward again, delighted, with the thought of climbing out for a while above the roof of the forest, the path dipped, and then again began to climb upwards, leading them at last to the foot of the steep hillside. There it left the trees and faded into the turf. The wood stood all around the hill like thick hair that ended sharply in a circle around a shaven crown. The hobbits led their ponies up, winding round and round until they reached the top. There they stood and gazed about them. The air was gleaming and sunlit, but hazy and they could not see to any great distance. Near at hand the mist was now almost gone, though here and there it lay in hollows of the wood, and to the south of them, out of a deep fold cutting right across the forest, the fog still rose like steam or wisps of white smoke. That, said Merry, pointing with his hand, that is the line of the Withy Windle. It comes down out of the downs and flows southwest through the mist of the forest to join the Brandywine below Hastened. We don't want to go that way. With the Withy Windle Valley, it is said to be the queerest part of the whole wood, the center of which all the queerness comes, as it were. The others looked in the direction that Mary pointed out, but they could see little but mists over the damp and deep-cut valley, and beyond the southern half of the forest faded from view. The sun on the hilltop was now getting hot. It must have been about eleven o'clock, but the autumn haze still prevented them from seeing much in other directions. In the west they could not make out either the line of the hedge of the, or the valley of the Brandywine beyond it. Northward, where they looked most hopefully, they could see nothing that might, that might be the line of the great east road of which they were making. They were on an island in a sea of trees, and the horizon was veiled. On the southeastern side the ground fell very steeply as if the slopes of the hill were continued far down under the trees, like island shores that really are the sides of a mountain rising out of deep waters. They sat on the green edge and looked out over the woods below them while they ate their midday meal. As the sun rose and passed noon, they glimpsed far off, in the eastern, the grey-green lines of the downs that lay beyond the old forest on that side. That cheered them greatly, 
for it was good to see a sight of anything beyond the wood's borders, though they did not mean to go that way, if they could help it. The Barrow Downs had a sinister reputation in Hobbit legend as the forest itself. At length they made up their minds to go on again. The path that had brought them to the hill reappeared on the northward side, but they had not followed it far before they became aware that it was bending steadily to the right. Soon it began to descend rapidly, and they guessed that it must actually be heading towards the Withywindle Valley, not at all the direction they wished to take. After some discussion, they decided to leave this misleading path and strike northward. For although they had not been able to see it in front of the hilltop, the road must lie that way, and it could not be many miles off. Also northward and to the left of the path, the land seemed to be drier and more open, climbing up to slopes where the trees were thinner, and pines and firs replaced the oaks, and ashes and other strange and nameless trees of denser wood. At first their choice seemed to be good. They got along at a fair speed, though whenever they got a glimpse of the sun in an open glade, they seemed unaccountably to have veered eastwards. But after a time the trees began to close in again, just where they had appeared from distance to be thinner and less tangled. The deep folds in the ground were discovered unexpectedly, like the ruts of great giant wheels or wide moats and sunken roads, long disused and choked with brambles. These lay unusually right across their line of march, and could not be crossed by scrambling down and out again, which was troublesome and difficult with their ponies. Each time they climbed down they found the hollow filled with thick brushes and matted undergrowth, which somehow would not yield to the left, but only gave way when they turned to the right and they had to go some distance along the bottom before they could find a way up the further bank. Each time they clambered out, the trees seemed deeper and darker, and always to the left and upwards it was most difficult to find a way, and they were forced to the right and downwards. After an hour or two they had lost all clear sense of direction, though they knew well enough that they had long ceased to go northward at all. They were being headed off and were simply following a course chosen for them, eastwards and southwards, into the heart of the forest and not out of it. The afternoon was wearing away, when they scrambled and stumbled into a fold that was wider and deeper than any they had yet met. It was so steep and overhung that it proved impossible to climb out of it again, either forwards or backwards, without leaving their ponies and their baggage behind. All they could do was to follow the fold, downwards. The ground grew soft, and in places boggy. Springs appeared in the banks, and soon they found themselves following a brook that trickled and babbled through a weedy bed. Then the ground began to fall rapidly, and the brook, growing strong and noisy, flowed and leaped swiftly downhill. They were in a deep, dim-lit gully overarched with trees high above them. After stumbling along for some way along the stream, they came quite suddenly out of the gloom. As if through a gate they saw the sunlight before them. Coming to the opening, they found that they had made their way down through a cleft in a high-speed bank, across a cliff. At its feet was a wide space of grass and reeds, and in the distance could be glimpsed another bank, almost as steep. A golden afternoon of late sunshine lay warm and drowsy upon the hidden land between. In the midst of it there wound lazily a dark river of brown water, bordered with ancient willows, arced over with willows, blocked with fallen willows, and flecked with thousands of faded willow leaves. The air was thick with them, fluttering yellow from the branches, for there was a warm and gentle breeze blowing softly in the valley, and the reeds were rustling and the willow bows were creaking. "'Well, now I have at least some notion of where we are,' said Mary. "'We've come almost in the opposite direction in which we intended. "'This is the River Withywindle. "'I will go on explore.' He passed out into the sunshine and disappeared into the long grasses. After a while he reappeared and reported that there was fairly solid ground between the cliff foot and the river, in some places, firm turf went down to the water's edge. "'What's more,' he said, "'there seems to be something like a footpath winding along this side of the river.' 
If we turn left and follow it, we shall be bound to come out on the east side of the forest eventually. I dare say, said Pippin, that this, if the track goes so far and does not simply lead us into a bog and leave us there, who made the track, do you suppose, and why? I'm sure it was not for our benefit. I'm getting very suspicious of this forest and everything in it. And I begin to believe all the stories about it. And have you any idea how far eastward we should have to go? No, said Mary. I haven't. I don't know in the least how far down the withy winter we are, or who could possibly come here often enough to make a path along it. But there is no other way out that I can see or think of. There being nothing else for it, they filed out and Mary led them to the path that he had discovered. Everywhere the reeds and grasses were lush and tall, in places far above their heads. But once found, the path was easy to follow, as it turned and twisted, picking out the sounder ground among the bogs and pools. Here and there it passed over other rills, running down gullies into the withywindle out of the higher forest lands. And at these points there were tree trunks or bundles of brushwood laid carefully across. The hobbits began to feel very hot. There were armies of flies, of all kinds, buzzing around their ears, and the afternoon sun was burning on their backs. At last they came suddenly into a thin shade. Great grey branches reached across the path. Each step forward became more reluctant than the last. Sleepiness seemed to be creeping out of the ground and up their legs, and falling softly out of the air upon their heads and eyes. Frodo felt his chin go down and his head nod. Just in front of him, Pippin fell forward onto his knees. Frodo halted. He's no good, he heard Mary saying. Can't go another step without rest. Must have nap. It's cool under the willows. This flies. Frodo did not like the sound of this. Come on, he cried. We can't have a nap yet. We must get clear of the forest first. But the others were too far gone to care. Beside them, Sen stood yawning and blinking stupidly. Suddenly Frodo himself felt sleep overwhelm him. His head swam. There now seemed hardly a sound in the air. The flies had stopped buzzing. Only a gentle noise on the edge of hearing, a soft fluttering as of a song half whispered, seemed to stir in the balls above. He lifted his heavy eyes and saw leaning over him a huge willow tree, old and hoary. Enormous it looked, its sprawling branches going up like reaching arms with many long-fingered hands, its knotted and twisted trunk graping in wide fissures that leaked faintly as the bows moved. The leaves fluttering against the bright sky dazzled him, and he toppled over, lying where he fell upon the grass. Merry and Pippin dragged themselves forward and lay down with their backs to the willow trunk. Behind them the great cracks gaped wide to receive them as the tree swayed and creaked. They looked up at the grey and yellow leaves, moving softly against the light and singing. They shut their eyes, and then it seemed that they could almost hear words, cool words, saying something about water and sleep. They gave themselves up to the spell and fell fast asleep at the foot of the great grey willow. Frodo lay for a while fighting with the sleep that was overpowering him. Then with an effort he struggled to his feet again. He felt a compelling desire for cool water. Oh, wait for me, Sam, he stammered. Must bathe feet a minute. Half in a dream, he wandered forward to the river ward side of the tree, where the great winding roots grew into the stream, like gnarled dragonets straining down to drink. He straddled one of these and paddled his hot feet into the cool brown water, and there he too suddenly fell asleep with his back against the tree. Sam sat down and scratched his head, and yawned like a cavern. He was worried. The afternoon was getting late and he thought this sudden sleepiness uncanny. There's more behind this than sun and warm air, he muttered to himself. I don't like this great big tree. I don't trust it. Hark at it singing about sleep now. This won't do at all. 
he pulled himself to his feet and staggered off to see what had become of the ponies. He found that two had wandered on a good way along the path, and he had just caught them and brought them back towards the others. When he heard two noises, one loud and the other soft but very clear, one was a splash of something heavy falling into the water, the other was a noise like the snick of a lock when a door quietly closes fast. He rushed back to the bank. Frodo was in the water close to the hedge, and a great tree root seemed to be over him and holding him down, but he was not struggling. Sam gripped him by the jacket and dragged him from under the root, and then with difficulty hauled him onto the bank. Almost at once he woke and coughed and spluttered. Do you know, Sam, he said at length, the beastly tree threw me in. I felt it. The big root just twisted around and tipped me in. You were dreaming, I expect, Mr. Frodo, said Sam. You shouldn't sit in such a place if you feel sleepy. But what about the others? Frodo asked. I wonder what sort of dreams they were having. Where they ran round to the other side of the tree, and then Sam undertook the click they had heard. Pippin had vanished. The crack by which he had laid himself had closed together, so that not a chink could be seen. Mary was trapped. Another crack had closed about his waist. His legs lay outside, but the rest of him was inside a dark opening the edges of which gripped like a pair of pincers. Frodo and Sam beat first upon the tree trunk where Pippin had lain. They then struggled frantically to pull open the jaws of the crack that held poor Mary. It was quite useless. What a foul thing to happen, cried Frodo wildly. Why did we ever come to this dreadful forest? I wish we were all back at Crick Hollow. <laughs> he kicked the tree with all his strength, he was to his own feet. A hardly perceptible ship ran through the stream and up to the branches. The leaves rustled and whispered, with a sound of now faint and far-off laughter. I suppose we haven't got an axe among our luggage, Mr. Frodo? asked Sam. I brought a little hatchet for chopping firewood, said Frodo. That wouldn't be much use. Wait a minute, cried Sam, struck by an idea suggested by firewood. We might do something with fire! We might, said Frodo doubtfully. We might succeed in roasting Pippin alive inside. We might try to hurt or frighten this tree to begin with, said Sam fiercely. If it don't let them go, I'll have it down, if I have to ignore it. He ran to the ponies and before long came back with two tinder boxes and a hatchet. <laughs> Quickly they gathered dry grass and leaves and bits of bark and made a pile of broken twigs and chopped sticks. These they had heaped against the trunk on the far side of the tree and for the prisoners. As soon as Sam had struck a spark into the tinder, it kindled the dry grass, and a flurry of flame and smoke went up. The twigs cackled. Little fingers of fire licked against the dry, scored rind of the ancient tree and scorched it. A tremor ran through the whole willow. The leaves, the leaves seemed to hiss above their heads with a sound of pain and anger. A loud scream came from Mary, and from far inside the tree they heard Pippin give a muffled yell. Put it out! Put it out! cried Mary. He'll squeeze me and do it. You don't. He says no. Who? What? shouted Frodo, rushing round to the corner of the side of the tree. Put it out! Put it out! begged Mary. The branches of the willow began to sway violently. There was a sound as of a wind rising and spreading outwards to the branches of all the other trees up round about, as though they had dropped a stone into a quiet slumber of the river valley and set up ripples of anger that ran out over the whole forest. Sam kicked at the little fire and stamped out the sparks. But Frodo, without any clear idea of why he did so or what he hoped for, ran along the path crying, Help! 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 It seemed to him that he could hardly hear the sound of his own shrill voice. It was blown away from him by the willow wind and drowned in the clamor of leaves as soon as the words left his mouth. He felt desperate, lost, and witless. Suddenly he stopped. There was an answer, or so he thought, but it seemed to come from behind him, away down the path further back into the forest. He turned round and listened, and soon there could be no doubt. Someone was singing a song. A deep, glad voice was singing carelessly and happily. But it was singing nonsense.
Half hopeful and half afraid of some new danger, Frodo and Sam now both stood still. Suddenly, out of a long string of nonsense words, or so they seemed, the voice rose up loud and clear and burst into the song. Hey, come, merry doll, merry doll, thy darling. Life goes the weather wind and the bells carling. Down the lonely hill, shining in the sunlight, waiting on the force of the cold sunlight. There my pretty lady is, river woman's daughter. Slender as the willow one, clearer as the water. Oh, Tom Bombadil, water lily springing. Come along, hopping home again. Can you hear him ringing? Hey, come, Derry Doll, Derry Doll, a merry o, Goldberry, Goldberry, Mally Yellow Berry o. Poor old willow man, you tuck your roots away. Tom's in a hurry now. Evening will follow day. Tom's going home again. What are lilies bringing? Hey, come, Nerby doll, can't you hear me singing? Frodo and Sam stood as if enchanted. The wind puffed out. The leaves hung silently again on stiff branches. There was another burst of song, and then suddenly, hopping and dancing along the path, there appeared above the reeds an old battered hat with a tall crown and a long blue feather stuck into the band. With another hop and a bound, there came into view a man, or so it seemed. At any rate, he was too large and heavy for a hobbit, if not quite tall enough for one of the big people, though he made noise enough for one, stumping along with great yellow boots on his thick legs and charging through grass and rushes like a cow going down to drink. He had a blue coat and a long brown beard. His eyes were blue and bright. His face was red as a ripe apple, but creased into a hundred wrinkles of laughter. In his hands, he carried a large leaf as on a stray small pile of white water lilies. Help! cried Frodo and Sam, running towards him with their hands stretched out. Whoa, whoa! Steady there! cried the old man, holding up one hand, and they stopped short, as if they had been struck stiff. Hmm. Now, my little fellows, where be you a going to, puffin' like the bellows? What's the matter here, then? Do you know who I am? I'm Tom Bombadil. Tell me what's your trouble. Tom's in a hurry now. Don't you crush my lilies. And my friends are caught in the willow tree, cried Frodo breathlessly. Master Mary's been squeezing a crack. What? shouted Tom Bombadil, leaping up the air. Old Mal Willow. Not worse than that, eh? Oh. That can soon be mended. I know the tune for him, old grey willow man. I'll freeze his marrow cold if he don't behave himself. I'll sing his roots off. I'll sing a wind up and blow leaf and branch away, old man willow. Setting down his lilies carefully on the grass, he ran to the tree. There he saw Mary's feet still sticking out. The rest had already been drawn further inside. Tom put his mouth to the crack and began singing into it in a low voice. They could not catch the words, but evidently Mary was aroused. His legs began to kick. Tom sprang away, and breaking off a hanging branch, he smote the side of the willow with it. You let them out again, old man willow, he said. And what for you are thinking of? You should not be waking. Eat earth, dig deep, drink water, go to sleep. Bombadil is talking. He then seized Mary's feet and drew him out of the suddenly widening crack. There was a tearing creak, and the other crack split open, and out of it Pippin sprang as if he had been kicked. Then with a loud snap, both cracks closed fast again. A shudder ran through the tree, from root to tip, and complete silence fell. Thank you, thank you, said the hobbits, one after another. Tom Bombadil burst out laughing. Well, my little fellows, said he, stooping so that he peered into their faces. Hmm. You shall come home with me. The table is all laden with yellow cream, honeycomb, and white bread and butter. Goldberries awaiting. Time enough for questions around the supper table. You follow after me as quick as you are able. With that, he picked up his lilies, and then with a beckoning wave of his hand, went hopping and dancing along the path eastward, still singing loudly and nonsensically. Too surprised and too relieved to talk, the hobbits followed after him as fast as they could. But that was not fast enough. Tom soon disappeared in front of them, and the noise of his singing got fainter and further away. 
Suddenly, his voice came floating back to them with a loud halloo. Hop along, my yellow friends, up the withy window. Tom's going on ahead with candles for to kindle. Down! When the night shadows fall, then the door out from the window panes, light. Glory willow, nor bow, Tom goes on before you. We'll be waiting for you. After that, the hobbits heard no more. Almost at once, the sun seemed to sink into the trees behind them. They thought of the slanting light of evening littering into the Brandywine River, and the windows of Bucklebury beginning to gleam with hundreds of lights. Great shadows fell across them. Trunks and branches of trees hung dark and threatening all over the path. White mists began to rise and curl on the surface of the river, and stray about the roots of the trees upon its borders. Out of the very ground at their feet, a shadowy steam arose and mingled with the swiftly falling dusk. It became difficult to follow the path, and they were very tired. Their legs seemed laden. Strange, furtive noises ran among the bushes and reeds on either side of them, and if they looked up to the pale sky, they caught sight of queer, gnarled, and knobby faces that loomed dark against the twilight, and leered down at them from the high bank at the edges of the wood. They began to feel that all this country was unreal. And that they were stumbling through an ominous dream that led to no awakening. Just as they felt their feet slowing down to a standstill, they noticed the ground was gently rising. The water began to murmur. In the darkness, they caught the white glimmer of foam, where the river flowed over a short fall. Then suddenly, the trees came to an end, and the mists were left behind. They stepped out from the forest and found a wide sweep of grass welling up before them. The river, now small and swift, was leaping merrily down to meet them, glinting here and there in the light of the stars, which were already shining in the sky. The grass under their feet was smooth and short, as if it had been mown or shaven. The eaves of the forest behind were clipped and thin, as a hedge. The path was now plain before them, well tended and bordered with stone. It wound up to the top of a grassy knoll, now grey under the pale starry night. And there, still high above them, on a further slope, they saw the twinkling lights of a house. Down again the path went, and then up again, up a long, smooth hillside of turf, towards the light. Suddenly, a wide yellow beam flowed out brightly from a door that was opened. There was Tom Bombadil's house before them, up, down, under hill. Behind it, a steep shoulder of the land lay grey and bare. And beyond that, the dark shapes of the Barrow Downs stalked away to the eastern night. They all hurried forward, hobbits and ponies, already half their weariness, and all their fears had fallen from them. Hey, come, merry doll! Rolled out the song to greet them. Hey, come, merry doll! Hope along my hearties, hobbits, ponies, all. We're all fond of parties. Now let the fun begin. Let us sing together. Then another clear voice, as young and ancient as spring, like the song of a glad water flowing down into the night from a bright morning in the hills, came falling like silver to meet them. By the shady pool, lilies by the water, old Tom Bombadil, and the river daughter. That song, the hobbit stood upon the threshold, and a golden light was all about them. The four hobbits stepped over the wide stone threshold and stood still, blinking. They were in a long, low room filled with the light of lamps swinging from beams off the roof, and on the table of dark, polished wood stood many candles, tall and yellow, burning brightly. In a chair at the far side of the room, facing the outer door, sat a woman. Her long yellow hair rippled down her shoulders. Her gown was green, 
green as young reeds, shot with silver like beads of dew, and her belt was of gold, shaped like a chain of flag lilies set in the pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. About her feet, in wide vessels of green and brown earthenware, white water lilies were floating, so that she seemed to be enthroned in the midst of a pool. Enter, good guests, she said, and as she spoke, they knew it was her clear voice they were heard singing. They came a few timid steps further into the room and began to bow low, feeling strangely surprised and awkward, like folk that, knocking at a cottage door to beg for a drink of water, have been answered by a fair young elf queen clad in living flowers. But before they could say anything, she sprang lightly up and over the lily bowls and ran laughing towards them, and as she ran, her gown rustled softly like the wind in the flowering borders of a river. Come, dear folk, she said, taking Frodo by the hand. Laugh and be merry. I am Goldberry, daughter of the river. Then lightly she passed them, and closing the door, she turned her back to it, with her white arms spread out across it. Let us shut out the night, she said, for you are still afraid, perhaps, of mist and tree shadows and deep water and untamed things. <laughs> Fear nothing, for tonight you are under the roof of Tom Bombadil. The hobbits looked at her in wonder, and she looked at each of them and smiled. Fair Lady Goldberry, said Frodo at last, feeling his heart moved with a joy that he did not understand. He stood as he had at times stood enchanted by fair elven voices, but the spell that was now laid upon him was different. Less keen and lofty was the delight, but deeper and nearer to the mortal heart. Marvellous, and yet not strange. Fair Lady Goldberry, he said again, now the joy that was hidden in the songs we heard is made plain to me. O oh, slender as the willow wand, O oh, clearer than clear water, O oh, reed by the living pool, fair river daughter, O oh, springtime and summertime, and spring again after, O oh, wind on the waterfall and leaves laughter. Suddenly he stopped and stammered, uh, overcome with his surprise to hear himself saying such things, but Goldberry laughed. <laughs> Welcome, she said. I have not heard that folk of the Shire was so sweet-tongued, but I see you are an elf friend. The light in your eyes and the ring in your voice tells it. It is a merry meeting. Sit now, sit and wait for the master in the house. He will not be long. He has tended your tired beasts. The hobbits sat down gladly in low, rush-seated chairs, while Goldberry busied herself around the table, and their eyes followed her, for the slender grace of her movement filled them with quiet delight. From somewhere behind the house came a sound of singing. Every now and again they caught among many a derry dole and merry dole and ring and ding and dillo the repeated words, Old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue his jacket is and his boots are yellow. Fair lady, said Frodo again after a while, tell me if my asking does not seem foolish. Who is Tom Bombadil? said Goldberry, staying her swift movements and smiling. Frodo looked at her questioningly. He is as you have seen him, she said in answer to his look. He is the master of the wood, water, and hill. Th then all this strange land belongs to him? No, indeed, she answered, and her smile faded. That would indeed be a burden, she added in a low voice, as if to herself. The trees and the grasses and all things growing or living in the land belong to each of themselves. Tom Bombadil is the master. No one has ever caught old Tom walking in the forest, wading in the water, leaping on the hilltops under the light and shadow. He has no fear. Tom Bombadil is master. A door opened and in came Tom Bombadil. He had now no hat and his thick brown hair was covered with autumn leaves. He laughed, and going to Goldberry, took her hand. <laughs> Here's my pretty lady, he said, bowing to the hobbits. Here's my Goldberry, clothed all in silver green, with flowers in her griddle. Here's the table, Haddon. I see yellow cream and honeycomb, and white bread and butter, milk cheese and green herbs, and ripe berries gathered. Is that enough for us? Is the supper ready? It is, said Goldberry. <laughs> But the guests perhaps are not. Oh. Tom clapped his hands and cried, 
Tom Tom! Your guests are tired and all, and you had near forgotten. Come now, merry friends, and Tom will refresh you. You shall clean grimy hands and wash your weary faces. Cast off your muddy cloaks and comb out your tangles. He opened the door and they folded him down the short passage and round a sharp turn. They came to a low room with a sloping roof. A penthouse, it seemed, built on the north end of the house. Its walls were of clean stone, but they were mostly covered with green hanging mats with yellow curtains. The floor was flagged and strewn with fresh green rushes. There were four deep mattresses, each piled with white blankets laid on the floor along one side. Against the opposite wall was a long bench, laden with white earthenware basins, and beside it stood brown ewers filled with water, some cold, some steaming hot. There were soft green slippers set ready beside each bed. Before long, washed and refreshed, the hobbits were seated at the table, two on each side, while at either end sat Goldberry and the master. It was a long and merry meal. Though the hobbits ate as only famished hobbits can eat, there was no luck. The drink in their drinking bowl seemed to be clear cold water, yet it went to their hearts like wine and set free their voices. The guests became suddenly aware that they were singing merrily, as if it was easier and more natural than talking. At last, Tom and Goldberry rose and cleared the table swiftly. The guests were commanded to sit quiet, and were set with chairs, each with a footstool to his tired feet. There was a fire in the wide hearth before them, and it was burning with a sweet smell, as if it were built of apple wood. When everything was set in order, all the lights in the room were put out, except one lamp and a pair of candles at each end of the chimney shelf. Then Goldberry came and stood before them, holding a candle, and she wished them each a good night and deep sleep. Have peace now, she said, until the morning. Heed no nightly noises. For nothing passes door and window here save moonlight and starlight. And the wind off the hilltop. Good night. She passed out of the room with a glimmer and a rustle. The sound of her footsteps was like a stream falling gently away downhill over cool stones with the quiet of night. Tom sat on a while beside them in silence, while each of them tried to muster the courage to ask one of the many questions they had meant to ask at supper. Sleep gathered on their eyelids. At last, Frodo spoke. D did you hear me calling, Master? Or was it just chance that brought you at that moment? Tom stirred like a man shaken out of an unpleasant dream. Hey, mm, what? Said he. Did I hear you calling? Nay, I did not hear. I was busy singing. Just chance brought me here then, if chance you call it. Why, <laughs> it was no plan of mine. Though I was waiting for you. We heard news of you, and learned that you were wandering. We guessed you'd come here along down the water. All paths lead that way, down to the withy windle. Old Grey Willow Man, he's a mighty singer, and it's hard for little folk to escape his cunning mazes. The Tom had an errand there that he dared not hinder. Tom nodded, as if sleep was taking him again, but he went on in a soft singing voice. I had an errand there, gathering water lilies, green leaves and lilies white to please my pretty lady. The last year the year's end to keep them from the winter, to flower by their pretty feet till the sound snows are melted. Each year at summer's end I go to find them for her, in a wide pool deep and clear far down the withy window. There they open first in spring, and there they linger latest. By that pool long ago I found the river daughter, fair young Goldberry sitting in the rushes. Sweet was her singing then, and her heart was beating. He opened his eyes and looked at them with sudden glint of blue. And that proved well for you, for now I shall no longer go down deep again along the forest water. Not while the year is old, nor shall I be passing. Old Man Willow's house is, is 
of springtime not till the merry spring when the river daughter dances down the worthy path to bathe in the water <sighs> he fell silent again but frodo could not help asking one more question the one that most desired to have answered tell us master he said about the willow man what is he i've never heard of him before no don't said Merry and Pippin together, sitting suddenly upright. Not now. Not until the morning. Oh, that is right, said the old man. Now is the time for resting. Some things are ill to hear when the world's in shadow. Sleep till the morning light, lest on the pillow. Heed no nightly noise. Fear no grey willow. And with that he took down the lamp and blew it out. And grasping a candle in either hand, he led them out of the room. Their mattresses and pillows were soft as were soft as down, and the blankets were of white wool. They had hardly laid themselves on the deep beds and drawn the light covers over them before they were asleep. In the dead night, Frodo lay in a dream without light. Then he saw the young moon rising. Under its thin light there loomed before him a black wall of rock, pierced by a dark arch like a great gate. It seemed to Frodo that he was lifted up, and passing over he saw that the rock wall was the circle of hills, and that within it was a plain, and in the midst of the plain stood a pinnacle of stone, like a vast tower, but not made by hands. On its top stood the figure of a man. The moon as it rose seemed to hang for a moment above his head and glistened in his white hair as the wind stirred it. Up from the dark plain below came the crying of fell voices, and the howling of many wolves. Suddenly a shadow, like the shape of great wings, passed across the moon. The figure lifted his arms and a light flashed from the staff that he wielded. A mighty eagle swept down and bore him away. The voices wailed and the wolves yammered. There was a noise like a strong wind blowing, and on it was borne the sound of hoofs galloping, galloping from the east. Back riders, thought Frodo.